Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready for the What's Up Podcast. With your host, Stu OG Industry Shannon and Will Warren Davey, new school formulator extraordinaire. We're talking all things supplements with insiders, athletes, experts, and more. So sit back, relax, and prepare to find out what's up. G'day guys, welcome to another episode of the What's Up podcast. We have a very special guest for you today. It is Christine Enville. She, as most of you will already know, um, has had an illustrious career as a professional bodybuilder, three times world champion. But something that a lot of people don't know about Christine is that she's also a world-class supplement formulator and a qualified food scientist. So we're going to pick her brain a little bit today on supplements, um, where supplements in Australia have come from, uh, where they are now, where they're heading, and just basically pick her brain on everything we can. So welcome to the show, Christine. Thanks, guys. It's great to be here. And yeah, um, supplements is my life. Like that's actually more than being a bodybuilder. I started out as you know, you know, training to be a food scientist and actually did my first comp just before I started my university degree. So it's kind of like the two things have gone parallel. But to me, I'm first and foremost, uh, you know, a food scientist and supplements and food and nutrition is kind of my my gig. And the, I guess the bodybuilding was just a side thing. <laughs> kind of. It's a very <laughs> successful side gig. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So, sorry for my rudeness there. Well, of course, I've got my regular co-host, um, Will, with me this morning. Welcome, Will. Morning, mate. It's good to be back. We've been absolutely flat chat lately, so we haven't had a, a chance to put out as much as we'd like in these episodes. But I'm thrilled because we're making up for quantity with quality today. So this should be this should be fun. Yeah, that's right. And I think, Christine, you know, I'd like to really um, kick things off um, with you, just giving people a bit of a background about um, sort of how you got started in supplements. Um, you know, I think that there's. A lot of different avenues people take these days, but I think the main avenue that people getting into supplements um, take is, or people getting into, I guess, uh, making their own supplements take is, you know, oh, I kind of am interested in in um, doing a supplement and making some money. Go to a contract manufacturer, just make me whatever the hell you can that I can market really well. Um, but that's not really the um, the tact that you um, have taken, or that you would probably like to see taken. I'm assuming. Absolutely not. And, and I guess with, like taking it back, as I said, I start, you know, I qualified as a food scientist in parallel with doing my bodybuilding career. And at that time, you know, the supplement industry didn't really exist. Like if anyone can remember back that far, there was like Weeda um, and maybe there was a little, little bit of balance supplements and a few other small ones. So as far as being interested in that, I always kind of had that interest. And as I was, you know, obviously doing my degree, I kind of would like listen out for anything to do with protein or anything to do with supplements and and understanding that side of it um I think also that was kind of the time when Masashi and and Aussie bodies were kicking off but it just you know when you're getting graduated and you're putting all your money into bodybuilding you're not really thinking about you know getting into supplements and of course business because you're focused on competing so what actually happened was um I'd been working for a couple of years I've been working for people like Uncle Toby's um Parmalat you know the big dairy company and um Across the road from where I worked, it was Fonterra, or it wasn't called Fonterra back in those days. It was New Zealand milk products. And um, obviously they did all the, you know, they had started doing whey proteins and even colostrum. And I was kind of good mates with one of the guys that was a sales rep there. And they would give me like full bags of protein. Okay, yeah, here, here's a bag of colostrum. You know, here's a bag of um, <laughs> what, you know, of wow. calcium case. Like, they would actually literally give me 25 kilo bags um, mm. and I would fiddle around in the kitchen and kind of make up the blends that I wanted for myself. Like I was already into, you know, how quickly a different protein digests and which is the best one to have for muscle growth, which is the best one to have for fat loss. What time do you want to have them? So I was already in my own diets, you know, making my own blends up around what I actually thought was, was good. Um, and then along comes the supplement industry kind of kicked off and, and I started to get approached by companies who were starting out brands and they would say, oh, develop a product for us. So I actually got started developing other people's products, obviously yeah. with my knowledge and my, because, um, you know, with, with, with supplements and everything, it's not just about the what's going into it, it's making it so that someone actually wants to eat it. Um, <laughs> so the flavour, you know, the flavour, the consistency, all, all of those kind of things. So I literally, um, there was a, a company called um, Bionutrix that kind of, 
never really went anywhere, but literally they kind of came to me and said, develop your dream supplement, like develop your dream range. And um, I went ahead and developed this dream range and then got the costings back for them and they were kind of like, oh, no, we can't sell it for that price. Can you just like take this out and take that out? So so from doing that um, and obviously being in the industry, I started to get encouragement from people saying, well, why don't you do your own range? Like, why don't you do your own range? You're doing all this stuff for other people. And I kind of went, ah, I hadn't really thought about that because it just my brain wasn't business orientated at that stage. So it really was about competing. It was about being the best bodybuilder that I could be. Uh, so literally it was, um, you know, once we kind of been, you know, in it a while and doing that for other people that I did actually start to think about doing that. And it was really only when I moved from Melbourne up to Queensland that I had time to do it because in Melbourne, I mean, you guys are Sydney based, right? Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it, so it's a city and you, you, there's always something to do. And, you know, the weekends were just taken up with just stuff. And then you kind of move up to Queensland and then this is going back 20 years ago. So apologies to anyone. I'm not having any, having a go at Queensland, but it's a slower pace. So literally, you know, once we kind of trained and done everything, I had like my Saturday afternoons and I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? Mm. So I started to actually really put the formulations together and really like, like our focus with international with international protein really was to um, develop something that you could eat all year round because, you know, when, when I was competing, I would spend up to 10 months a year on a very, very strict diet. Um, I will say that I was at one point sponsored by Masashi and that's why with that's why I was making my own blends because literally the stuff was so unpalatable. Like it literally burnt your throat well, when you had it. That's an interesting point you make there, um, Christine, about the taste. So, um, and I don't know if this is true or not, but um, I think it was Nick Jones um, who we had on the on the show um, a few months back now, and he told us that kind of a lot of the nutritional sports supplements um, of the time were being developed by biochemists rather than food scientists, and so you know the focus was not on on um like you said it, it didn't have to be user friendly it just had to contain ingredients that were going to perform is that kind of where you like just for those of us who don't know maybe you could just give us a little bit of info about what a food scientist actually is and what that actually means that that is true I, so but a food scientist actually can be many many things but we learn all about like the the chemistry of food so we learn about how it reacts when it when it cooks, when it interacts with other ingredients, the nutritional comp composition of it. We also learn a lot about the processing of food. So it's not like a cook or a chef who understands about cooking. We are really to go out there and make food which goes up on your supermarket shelf and has to last for, you know, six months, two years kind of thing. So we have to understand what the different, like, industrial processes are going to do to food what that's going to do to the nutrient content um, and then also all of those other things on the label that you see, like, you know, your emulsifiers and your stabilizers, like what are they actually doing? Do you need them? Why are they in there? Uh, so we learn about the role of all, I guess, those food additives that, that people see them in food and maybe don't really understand why they're in there, but most of them have like a technological function in there. So our degree encompasses, you know, inorganic chemistry, you know, organic chemistry and physical chemistry because it's all about, um, you know, the thermodynamic reactions and um, how that reacts within the body, how that reacts with food. You have to understand the chemical structure of all the food. You also do a um, two-year nutrition component. So you're obviously learning how the body um, processes food. You also understand how people come up with things like the RDIs and stuff like that. Like where does this magic number come from and what's the background behind actually coming to that? Uh, but, yeah, you do a lot of practical work in actually putting the food through the process and observing what happens and, you know, why does, why does um, you put, you know, a sugar and protein together? Why does it go black? Like, you know, that's Maillard browning, like all, all those type of things. And then you get exposed to obviously the, those, you know, the secret ingredients that aren't available on the supermarket shelf. Although now with um, internet and everything, people can buy a lot of the little bits and pieces that food technologists use. Mm. Um, so essentially that's what it is. And then obviously if you go into it, there's the quality assurance aspect and looking at specifications and looking at standardisation and understanding like, uh, for example, creatine is a great example um, people talk about the mesh size, like, oh, it's got to be, you know, 200 mesh. And what does that actually mean? Because, you know, basically like the bigger that number, the finer the powder is. And, and that's essentially all of that means. But the, that and like the bulk density and all of these things which come into when you're manufacturing a product, um, you know, particularly in powder blending, the bulk density is so critical because if it's changing too much and one day it's fitting your packaging and then the next day it's not fitting your packaging because the bulk density has changed. 
that's an interesting point as well that I've noticed um, and that I um, that you just touched on is like mesh size and um, and particle size. And it's something that the, the really good manufacturers care a lot about because if you get like um, lots of different mesh sizes, right, you end up with this like um, like this pebble and sand type effect where yeah. – the, the, the powder doesn't stay uniform. You'll end up with like different ingredients settling at the bottom of the, at the tub, other ingredients sitting at the top. Um, and it's just a terrible blend, right? Yeah. It's also really tricky with, um, cause again, with, with powder blending, um, how you get an even dispersion. So for example, where you might have the bulk of your, your thing might in, and I'm going to say in the old days before 30th of November, when it was like citrulline no. was like the bulk of your, of your pre-workout. Mm. And then you have all these other tiny little ingredients. If you're not adding them in the right order and in the right way, you can potentially get what we call hot spots where you've got like one part of the blend has a higher concentration of that ingredient because you can't just kind of like dump everything all in together and hope that it blends and that <laughs> you don't just keep on blending it more because like because basically powder blends and unblends and blends and unblends. So it's not, it's not a matter of just like mix it for longer and it will come good because it'll actually come good and then go bad again and then go good and then go bad again. Like well, we've, all seen, we've all seen this, right, with the with the gym bro who comes in with his own um, – <laughs> With his own pre-workout that he's made at home, you know, one scoop you take makes you feel like you're going to die and the next scoop you take just, just does nothing and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it is, but it's not only that, but it's also, um, you know, the larger the particle size sometimes has its advantages because it doesn't clump. Like, obviously, again, we've all suffered the pre-workout that's turned into cement in our, you know, in the cupboard over, over summer or something. Um, but the more granular and the, the bigger the particle size is, less chance of it actually doing that. And, and not supplement related, but think about, like, from sugar to icing sugar. In manufacturing, oh, God, you know, if you've got to use icing sugar in a recipe, you know production is just going to go nuts at you because the bags are going to go rock hard because it's just it's not that the sugar's any stickier than the other sugar. It's just that when it's in a really fine powder it'll compact and it'll it'll yeah. create those rocks and everything. But then what happens is you drop it into your drink and then someone gives it a shake and then they drink it and it hasn't fully solubilised. So, number one, you kind of like it's going into your stomach in an insoluble um, way, so then it's going to take a little bit longer to potentially react or it may even pass through without actually being absorbed properly. Um, and then the other thing is things like your sweeteners. If your sweeteners are a different mesh size, the same thing again, like if you, do, if you have a gra more granular sucralose and you don't let it dissolve, your drink doesn't taste sweet. Or then by the time you get to the bottom of the shaker, it has dissolved and it's like, wow, oh, Christ, this stuff's so <laughs> sweet. That's so, really yeah, unique, actually. Those... That, that sort of stuff's all like stuff that like obviously all, like having, having um, dealt with these from all different, you know, working with three, four manufacturers over the years, I've, I've seen these, the clumping with the um, stability issues, I've seen uneven mixing, I've seen, seen all these sort of features in products. What, what I find really quite um, interesting there is when, when you spoke on, um, I guess, with, with going back to the protein segue, um, and, and I guess I had a look on, on, on your socials uh, previously, you'd done a video actually on um, doing a protein coffee. And, and I guess that's something that I think for a lot of our listeners, right, it, it, heat and denaturing, uh, and I guess going, going more to your, your actual food chemistry background, I'd love to know. I'd love to see. Um, I guess what's your insight in in that realm? Because a lot of people say, uh, you know, I guess it's going into you know pH three stomach acid anyway. You know, what, what upon consumption, like it, it gets broken down into free form amino acids anyhow upon digestion. So does it really matter if it's getting heated slightly before ingestion? Like, is there much? You know, credit to to denaturing a protein affecting its you know MPS it, roles in the body or anything it, like that. Um, not not to the degree that you're going to do in your kitchen. So putting it in hot water like that. The reason why denaturing is an issue there is because it goes friggin' grainy. <laughs> like, have you ever tried to drink that stuff? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, stuck it, stuck it stuck it on your oats. Put hot water on it. It's like nutritionally, that's not going to be significant. What it does to it because it's still only a hundred degree water. And to think about it, like in manufacturing, you know, UHT, you want to take it up to over 130 degrees for a short period of time. But the thing with denaturing is maybe what people don't understand is it's not the same as digesting. So digesting is when you're breaking that down. Denaturing actually puts the protein in a form which is harder to get to. Right. So, so, it's, so it's more it's more so, so locking up the amino acids, like the peptide chains, than it is so much an issue of... Because I, uh, I guess... Uh, I, yeah, I thought, you, 
And what about what? things like protein balls then? What about when girls are using like a, a protein powder to cook protein balls or, or like, a, like you know, some people put protein in their recipe and cook it in the oven. Yeah, it, it do, it's not enough to really significantly, like you're going to get some, some changes and, and that, but it's not going to be like, oh, okay, now there's no protein left. Mm. It does, it's not like a vitamin. So a vitamin, yes, if it's a heat, a heat labile vitamin, you're going to knock it right out and you're going to basically have nothing left. So um, that, you know, that's a whole other subject where not every vitamin, like some don't like light, some don't like heat, some like don't pH, and they all don't like different things. So it's actually really complex to get a good um, stable vitamin mix into a, into a food product. But with protein, it's pretty robust. So that type of cooking and that, you'd, you'd have to literally turn it to the point where it's inedible, like charcoal, um, to, to say, okay, there is now no longer any viable protein in that. And, of course, you're not going to eat that. So... You have to take that's, it to the point. That's how you eat your steaks, isn't it, Will? <laughs> oh, mate, I'm wrong. I'm, 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 I'm a fan of blue. I'm a blue fan. But it is, actually, that, you touched on vitamins there. I know this is a whole rabbit hole in itself, but one thing that I think almost no one is, because we've got a lot of uh, bro scientists in the game, but we haven't got a lot of actual scientists. And I think the role of, uh, there was a big sort of debacle of it, probably about 12, 18 months ago, where people were starting to really rag on synthetic forms of vitamins um, and starting to look closer at, multivitamin supplements being something that more than a billion people globally use each day on actually you know, interference absorption issues. So in your experience working with um, the typical sort of, you know, forms of vitamins we'll see, um, particularly the TGA now making some significant changes, but so the typical forms you'll see are the vitamins and minerals that we have in sports supplements today. Um, do you find in general, you know, uh, throwing them all in and just hoping for the best is often, you know, more of a, more of a drama than not and just really, you know, well, what's your take on people putting a lot of sprinkling a lot of these in, in formulas and so on, just hoping for the best? I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be uh, like this is not a thing that people probably really want to hear, but the amounts that people are putting into formulations aren't really significant. Like to make a claim, you have to put 10% of the RDI, and most people will hang around 20% of the RDI for a general vitamin mineral mix. Obviously, cost is a factor in taste. If you start to put too many of those vit B vitamins, particularly into your protein powder you're going to get a really, really off taste. So at that level, you're not going to have too much trouble. Like it's not really going to be, you're not relying on that for your vitamin mineral intake. Like, you know, 10, 20% isn't going to be a significant amount. Um, and at the same time, that mostly the, you know, the, the water soluble ones, there isn't really a maximum limit that you can have. So you're not going to kill yourself. You're not going to hurt yourself if you're having it from that and, and, and a few different things. So a lot of the time in a protein powder, you're pretty safe because it's dark. Like it's, it's not, you know, not exposed to the light. Um, it's not an extreme temperature. It's not an extreme pH. There's no moisture for it to break down. So whatever's in there is pretty much in there. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's probably wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on that for my, my vitamin mineral source. In fact, like, I would highly encourage people to actually try to get those out of their natural food, like as much as possible. Um, and it is possible even on a pretty restricted diet to get pretty much everything that you need. Everything above that is almost like a bonus and you're kind of doing it as an insurance policy. Um, but if you want to get down to the specifics of um, if there's a specific condition or a need that somebody has, that's a whole different story. But if someone's just talking about general health and fitness, then it's, it's almost like it's nice to see it on the label, but it's not really like you're not... I wouldn't buy a product if it costs more because it had it in versus one that didn't have it in. Like, you know, you're not, it's kind of a, it's like, yeah, great. It's in there. But at the same time, it's, it's to me, it's a little bit ho-hum with, with vitamins, yeah. to be honest, like B vitamins in pre-workouts, uh, obviously like formulated caffeinated beverage, you're allowed to use a much, much higher level. Um, I'm a huge fan of Barocca, to be honest, like, you know, a good dose of B vitamins can't go wrong with that. Um, but it, but the amount that we're allowed to put into food is nowhere near obviously what we're allowed to put into a Barocca and that's where you're kind of talking some really, really high levels. So that's, I mean, like what's in food is generally not anything to, it's not, it's not harmful. It's, it's going to potentially do something if you need it, but you, you know, you, you're, if you're in the sports industry, I actually think you should be eating a better diet anyway. Uh, and you should be deriving a lot of that naturally from, you know, from your fresh meat and, and your vegetables and fruit and still eating all of that food because these yeah. are still supplements. As much as I sell supplements, they are still supplements. It's, that, that's it's really unique. Fun. Oh, sorry, Stu. Um, You're right, I, Will. I just, I just thought, mate, with the caffeinated beverage um, side of things, using higher doses in the B vitamins, I was always wondering what, 
why, where's the, I guess the rationale behind that always seen to be unusual is you could have higher concentrations of vitamins alongside a caffeinated beverage, where typically when you see a stimulant introduced in the body, you know, it, it acts very differently. It, you know, when, you, when you've got things elevated, like, you know, um, cortisol, depending on the amount of the stimulant or whatever it might be. But if you've got, you know, if you've got, um, you know, sort of 40 milligrams of riboflavin with 300 milligrams of caffeine versus in a non-caffeinated food, I would think the higher amount in the food would be safer than throwing it in with a, whilst the body's in a different state. To, I don't did, know. Did, what, what, yeah, there's, there's no safety issue. With, with any of your soluble vitamins, there's really no safety issue. Um, what I mean, the reason why they're allowed at a higher level is because obviously the B vitamins have a lot to do with energy production. So with, you know, it, it's, it's high, high doses of B vitamins have been shown to increase energy. So that whole standard was basically produced as an energy drink, like the caffeine, you know, the inositol, the taurine and the B vitamins are all to do with your energy production and your mental, you know, get your brain stimulated and that. So it's, kind of was developed for a whole different reason like they weren't thinking about sports performance they were really just thinking about um you know well the everyday person extreme sports um so that so it's not a it's not going to harm your body because literally any b vitamins that you don't need just come out in your urine um you know that's where that's when it goes really yellow where you get that kind of veggie mite type of smell or something like that but that's why it's in that in that um particular standard is because the whole purpose of that standard is to create something which gives you mental and physical energy. Whereas obviously that also translates into wanting to use that in the gym. And that standard, I believe, came out like, you know, well before the supplement industry was even like developed or anything like that. Like the actual, I, I can't remember exactly when that came out, but basically what happened was New Zealand, as you know, has a different lot of standards. Like they have the um, dietary supplement standard, which sits one step above kind of what we have in that it's not TGA, but it's way, way, way freer. And it literally caters for what is most sports supplements. Australia doesn't have that. We literally have food standard and we have TGA. And what happened was obviously all of the people in New Zealand, the companies that were making V and everything, um, were flooding the Australian market because we have a you know trans-Tasman agreement. So they were allowed to make these products that had this caffeine, these B vitamins, had all this really cool stuff in it under their dietary supplements. And then they were exporting it back into Australia or Australia wanted it. So they actually had to create the standard so it could get manufactured in Australia. So that's how that came about from a food perspective because that, that standard didn't exist when I started my career as a food technologist. Wow. The sports food standard came in probably uh, late 90s or something because, again, I remember I was in my first job at Uncle Toby's and it was like a big deal that this standard came out. But if you look at what's in it, it's like that's what was in subs at that time like that um i can't even pronounce it but the gamma or resin or whatever who uses that these days but that was literally like oh my god that was like the latest and greatest when that was put together now what happened there was obviously nobody put in a really great mechanism of getting new stuff in like it's a really expensive cumbersome method and nobody really understands the people who are reviewing it don't really understand sports supplements so we've been stuck with this standard for you know 20 odd years but, um, but yeah, so, so that, that's kind of like, you know, food, food wasn't set up to deal with that. And like at that point in time as well, pre-workouts didn't even exist. Mm. You know, they came way, way, way later. So when they, were, when they were creating this standard, you had Masashi who was doing their free forms under TGA. You had, you know, everything was still very much around protein focus. And the, the pre-workouts kind of came like, you know, early in Australia, it wasn't until like early 2000 that I really started to hear a lot of noise about that. And the standard was created like about five years before that. So creatine was about as far as what, you know, creatine, carnitine, carnitine's always been around as long as I can remember. So mm. that's why, you know, when this other standard came out, nobody was even thinking of all the things that we have today. And the, the thing that I see today on the market is most of our pre-workouts in Australia are kind of a hybrid of the formulated um, supplementary sports food and the formulated caffeinated beverage. So literally people like you, you need the ingredients from both. So, you know, people just want to put them together. And that, the whole thing is, well, hang on, if I'm allowed to have it there at that level, and I'm allowed to have it there in that level. How come I can't have it together? And I think that that's where um, food will move that way. Like they, I think they are kind of the, the feedback that we get is that literally they're kind of turning a blind eye somewhat to what's in food, because the other thing or the reason what, you know, gets people in regulatory um, side of things gets them kind of excited or upset is this, the danger or the safety of a product. So by the time something's been in the market for 20 years, it's almost like it's done its own safety research. 
Mm. So they're kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, we're not so fussed about that because it's people have been using it. So we're not going to, like, we're more, they're more worried by does it have an allergen in the product? Like that's the number one focus really is food, um, food safety. Is it going to kill someone from bacterial poisoning or is it going to give someone allergic reaction? And that's what really kind of excites the, um, the food bodies. And then all of these sports supplements, unless it's something considered almost narcotic and like your dynamines and your um, methyltyramines and all those things that just got recently put onto the poisons list. Mm. Um, they, they consider that everything else is almost like they, they just, they recognize that the standard just hasn't been able to keep up with um, the research and, and basically the, the way that the sports um, industry has moved. So that's I think that's why. Why. that's really incredible because no one's been around long enough to sort of see it transition, I suppose. And we had this massive shift with, a lot of your amino acids that, like you said, have been used for decades, but no one now really has put it forward to be approved for human use. So citrulline malate, for example, every single pre-workout in the market has, you know, has a good solid whack of this um, you know, L-citrulline bound to malic acid. And it's been completely, you know, like malic acid for the Krebs cycle is great. L-citrulline is amino acid. It's found in our diet in abundance anyway. And, you know, like, yet now it's, sort of, you know, I guess there was a bit, there's been a big backflip where a lot of people are reformulating and taking out things like acetyl L-carnitines, L-citrulline, beta-alanines, betaines. Um, and I suppose, yeah, that, that big shift, was that something you, you, you foresee with your experience and seeing how it's been over, over the decades, I suppose? Do you see that being a, a shift back in some point? Or do you think there'll be a bit of a, a backpedal from, from, from that, do you think, where maybe some of these amino acids get considered, you know, more, more, more appropriately? Or? Yeah, definitely. Like there's actually a, a proposal in at the moment for them to basically review that standard. So there's a, a massive opportunity at the moment for the food industry or sports supplement industry to get involved and ask for what we want. Um, but the caveat to that is that we have to prove that it's safe. Mm. So if there's data from overseas, if there's, you know, the companies who do the, the actual make, who ma manufacture, uh, and that's where I think the trademark ingredients play a really important role is because if someone's gone to the extent of putting a trademark on an ingredient, they've got a lot of research around it. Like they've got more than the, um, than the generics as we call them, um, so I think that there's a really good um, opportunity. The only problem is it's going to be a bit of a slow process. It's probably going to take two to probably two to five years until that's all worked out. Uh, but as I said, we kind of are getting the feedback that the, the state authorities, like you're going to get the one odd one here or there who decides to be a bit of a, you know what, but majority of them are going to, you know, you put a little bit too much beta alanine in or you put, you know, betaine in. I don't think anyone's going to get too excited. Like you'd have to be probably like really, really unlucky. Um, for, and all they're going to do is just go, hey, take it out, change your label. Like I don't think there's going to be a big deal over that because I think at the same time they're recognising that, you know, time time is shifting. Um, so, so we've got a massive opportunity at the moment to actually put forward what we want in what alternatives, different dosage levels, um, you know, based on what evidence is out there. So, again, you know, we're looking to what's going on in other countries to be able to say, okay, what work's already been done and just fast track and get that put through. So that's one thing. But then the second part of that is they really need to get a better mechanism to be able to include new things, you know, like um, so we're not sitting here in another 20 years looking back and going, oh, my God, I can't believe we were even using these supplements. Like we want to put this in now. So that's another thing that needs to be addressed is like once they – clean up and, and fix up what can go in, um, then we need to kind of take a step forward and say, how do we get new things put in? But in the same frame of that, you have to keep in mind that the whole point of what food is, is that it's still food. And we do push that boundary really, really heavily into the obviously complementary health and TGA. So um, herbs is a really contentious issue because, you know, we want to use them in our formulations because there's some, you know, really great evidence around what they do and if at the very least you know they're quite healthy for you in different aspects whether it be um you know just you know helping with antioxidants or you know helping inflammation but the problem is then the the tga kind of turns around and goes ah inflammation that's not a sports performance that's health and it's saying you can have these things but you've got to put them under tga and then what that obviously means is the price goes sky high because there's a lot of extra um layers of of um documentation and different things that go into the tga manufacturing side of it that aren't in food so i think it's that problem where they're not saying that these things aren't okay it's that you you really got to keep in mind that does this improve sports performance or does it improve health because health is not the the um it's not the area of food unless it is literally from fresh food so that's See, just some that's, of the that's such a hard one 
to address as well, isn't it? Because like, let's look at inflammation, for example, if you are improving, inf- if you're decreasing inflammation, you're also improving sports performance. So exactly. it's like, well, okay, <laughs> so is it a health or is it sports performance? You know, like at the end of the day, when we're in a healthier state, our performance in sports also improves. And it's, 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 truly, it's, it's truly tricky, isn't it? It is. And I think that's where it's going to come down to, um, you know, maybe some really good um, speakers or people who draft up these, the proposals in, in how they actually write it and how they put it forward in, in making that linking to linkage towards sports performance. Because I think that's the one thing that we can't lose sight of is that is the formulated supplementary sports food. And that, that is the, that is the key thing. So that, and again, that's where things like all oh, your nootropics become very, very contentious, your sleep formulations, because yes, better sleep means better sports performance, but it's a physiological um, state. And and and, and I, I personally have a dilemma with it myself because obviously I'm a food scientist, not a not a biochemist. And just coming back to that question, obviously biochemists understand very heavily the way that things interact within our own um, processes and they understand the chemistry, but they don't necessarily understand the, the what I call the organ, organoleptic aspects, which is your taste, your texture, your odor, and your performance. Like you know, because most of those people are formulating to put it in a capsule, mm. which who really cares what that tastes like? You know, you down it. Uh, whereas we're we're making something that we're putting in a in a way that you would consume it within your normal day as, as a food, whether it be a drink or a you know a, a pudding that you make up or goodness knows whatever you want to make up. Uh, and and that's that's the thing. It's like. It, it, the supplement industry definitely had, you know, started out in one way um, and then it's transitioned into another where we, because of that impact on performance, we want all of those things. We want to be able to call them our own. Um, and, in, and as I said, in New Zealand, they have dietary supplements. You know, America just pretty much has FDA and everything's under FDA. So they kind of work like they are changing a lot. Um, and, and I've actually even recently just seen some warnings that have gone on to um, some amino acids and stuff about uh, I think it's about fertility and cancer or something. It's almost like a cigarette packet now, like mm. on, a, on a sports supplement. So that America's changing, but they have a very different approach to how they regulate their supplements in the majority of the time. Yeah, I remember like- con- Controlled Labs um, used to have a, a big standard warning that basically said on it, um, this product contains ingredients um, n- known, uh, this, this product contains known carcinogens, blah, 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 you know, and it's like, I look at it and you're like, okay, well, it's standard, you know, it's standard ingredients, but the warning after you read it, you know, you really would not want to yeah. take the supplement because you'd be like, it's pretty much saying if I take this, I'm going to die. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're a bodybuilder, you're like, yeah, give me two. I'm on <laughs> but, will it, but will it gain muscle? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what it I'll get cancer, that's but right. will I get jack? <laughs> that's right. Am I going to be bigger? Ah. I'm, I'm willing to risk it. But, yeah, it, it's um, and just, you know, again, just talking about the American industry, when I, you know, first started travelling overseas to compete, so it probably was like late 90s, you couldn't buy a decent protein powder to save yourself over there because literally the American sports supplement market was based around all your norandrolones and all your um, your pro-hormones. I don't know if you guys remember that era. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw, but- when I very first started in this, it was still pro-hormone era and we could still order them over from the US. So, it was you know, epi- epi- andro, four andro, one andro, all, all of those um, yeah. cheeky ones that, you know, Blackstone kept around for longer than they probably should have. Um, <laughs> was, yeah, but, but yeah. you didn't, but they didn't need, and, and I guess this is, you know, obviously because the industry is a business, they didn't need to have protein powder because they made, obviously the margins on those things were so good that why would you even waste time with it? So I think like MedRx had, you know, their kind of meal replacement thing. And I think ProLab had a protein. There's a couple of other older brands that had something. So Australia as a country, we eat a lot of protein powder. Like we eat a lot more protein powder per capita than, you know, say America because they get really cheap chicken, really cheap meat and everything. So you travel over there and you just to find a decent protein powder back in the early 2000s was an absolute nightmare but then literally from like one year to the next, when they banned those pro hormones, like the next year, everybody had a protein powder. Yeah, they, they, were, all <laughs> they, were, they were classic. Remember, does everyone remember the cans, the RTDs, those that were like half a litre can? They had the, the RTD 51 and they had 50 grams of protein in them and they went, they had a chocolate peanut butter flavour and I remember getting um, getting those all the time. They were thick and sludgy and just like, like it was you know, putting two and a half scoops away into a can basically and it was, it was that, yeah, that was that was the old Meadow X days. I remember, I remember that. That was 
they were the golden era. Um, and that's how you sort of age it times compared to, again, um, going back 10 years, you know, like, pro- proteins come a massive way. And I, I think well, giving listeners who, um, I guess, a lot of our, you know, people who have been only looking at stuff in the last two, three years have been so spoiled walking into a market where flavouring is insane. Like, Will, you- Will, sorry, just can I just stop you just for one sec? Can you just check your... Um- on your bottom left corner that your microphone is blue yeti is selected and not your onboard microphone because nice. uh, we're getting a lot of hissing from your we're getting a lot of hissing from your microphone i'll cut this out in the edit that's right maybe we can um so down bottom left corner you should have a little picture of a microphone just click on that and under select a microphone is your yeti selected oh bugger up now Okay, it seems to be. Yeah, you've, you've. Oh, hang on, your hiss is back. Are you hearing that hiss? Are you hearing I the can. hiss coming? I can oh. now. Now that you pointed out, I can. I just yeah, put yeah. it and put it back in. Is that any better? I just put it back in then. No, it's it's hissing again, but that's okay. We'll uh, we'll we'll deal with it. I'll try and clean it up in post. <laughs> <laughs> just makes it harder for somebody on the back end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. but yeah. No, there definitely are. Shoot, sorry. They're good. Yeah, no, just to say, but yeah, people definitely are. Because remember, too, going back, so I started competing in 91. And I remember, you know, I was from, um, I was from Bendigo in in Victoria, and there was a health food store there. And they had like a little supplement section. And of course, you know, Masashi dominated that, Mm. had carried a few little products. And then I'd take a trip down to Melbourne. I think it was like Great Earth or something. So there was like, you know, there'd be like one or two little supplement shops. There wasn't online. You couldn't go or jump online really and buy stuff back in those days. So you literally had to hunt out these supplement shops. And, um, you know, some of the biggest supplements back then, obviously other than the, you know, the weed of 5,000 mega weight gainer thing, um, was um, beef liver tablets, which actually, and again, B vitamins, comes back to the energy and stuff. That was how you got your B vitamins and carnitine. So they were some of the first supplements that I ever took was carnitine. I actually... To this day, would still prep on carnitine. I think it's one of the most fabulous supplements for energy and fat loss. So that was like, that's literally what we had back in those days. And all of the Masashi amino acids are just a touch too expensive for this poor little student. Yeah. Um, so, and then it was literally while I was in my uni degree that whey protein concentrate, not isolate, concentrate became available to the market. So think about that too. Think about how every product nowadays is you know, generally based around a whey protein isolate or a whey protein concentrate. Mm. didn't exist yeah I, I even remember when i started when i very first started buying supplements i was about uh, 14 so this would have been in about 2000 2000 and maybe 2000 and down here in wollongong we did didn't have a supplement store um we used to go i used to go and buy um weed or weight gain powder from the chemist was where yeah. they started here. Um, and I remember, um, I remember there was a shop called Workout World opened up um, and they sold home gym equipment. Yes. Uh, you know, like yep. your sort of Kmart style, like you screw on dumbbells and stuff. And they had a supplement wall in there and yes. it was, um, it was Musashi and Redback Protein was the, oh, red was back. the two that they sold. And um, that, for me, I was like, oh, this is like, look at this. This is awesome. We've got this, like, supplements we can use. And um, and some of the older guys um, had been getting um, – some of the older guys that – I guess at that time I was going to a lot of the kind of guys in, you know, their 30s and 40s for advice about how to build muscle. And um, they were – I don't know where they were sourcing it from at the time, but they were using creatine – um, L-carnitine and HMB, um, yes. yeah, and um, and so that's what um, that's what I went into um, workout world asking for. I'm like, do you guys have creatine HMB? And um, they're like, no. At the moment, we've just got you know just what's here, mate. You know, like we're like, <laughs> this <laughs> is not a, 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 a ca- program. <laughs> it's such a unique carnitine's an interesting one, and it's, it's copped a bit of flack as but like first it was it's been like really really heavily focused on in the, in the fat burning market. You know, it's obviously been a really big main active in a lot of things, but a big part of it is also had some um, research around uh, I guess its actual bio, like bioavailability when taken orally, um, and they say you know I, I guess looking at the um, with your background and, and carnitine and so on and its efficacy, have you have you sort of um, was that an area in your studies that you that you sort of um, covered, I, I suppose, or was that in, you know something that was looked at? No, 
No, not specifically, but I know more for me it's anecdotal. Like I know if I um, hit a sticking point and it's, it's, and this is why it's probably one of the only supplements that I would say I know works because particular times and normally I, I find these things out when I stop doing something and then I kind of figure out why is this not working. And I do remember one particular comp where I was on my normal process. I was doing my cardio, doing my normal diet and it just my I just wasn't getting the fat off just wasn't coming off and then I kind of like you know did a, a bit of an audit of my diet and I realized that this particular comp for some reason I just hadn't taken carnitine and I went back on it and literally like within two weeks boom it, everything just moved quick and fast um, my very very first comp that I ever used it um, I remember like again because carnitine isn't something that you feel like a stim. like you pretty much you'd be like oh do I even take it and I remember I would go into the gym and I'd back you know my first comp, do my weight session and have to do my cardio afterwards. And I'd go to my weight session and I'd just be, I'd take my carnitine and I'd be so tired. Oh my God, my weight session. But then I'd get like, as I got towards the end of my weight session, I literally would be like, oh, I actually feel okay now. And I'd be ready to do cardio. And that's one of the benefits of, of carnitine, obviously, is that endurance um, part of it. It's not just the, you know, obviously it's liberating the body fat and allowing it to burn, um, mm. which obviously then translates into the endurance. So there's a, there's a lot of talk about um, the, you know, ability, the bioavailability, but, and that's where injectable carnitine got so popular, but it's yeah. actually horses who'd can't. Yeah, we used to, uptake. used to buy that from popular pet foods down here. Um, <laughs> go down and get your, your big pack of your horse carnitine injections. And <laughs> Cause, cause horses can't, basically horses can't <laughs> metabolize carnitine. Yeah, so they, yeah. and, 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 the th and the little secret to supplements, of course, is that all, a lot of it all comes out of the horse industry. Creatine yeah. came out of the horse industry, carnitine, it's where yeah. HMB gets used a lot. So a lot of what we see transitioning into sports nutrition actually starts out in horse nutrition because those things are way, way, way more valuable than what we are. Yeah, well, so that's what I remember. I remember a, um, a big bodybuilder who I really respected in my area. He used to get these... Um, he used to have these big 100 mil um, vials of um, vitamin B12, and they were for horses. And I said, mate, I said, honestly, like, do you trust that stuff? And he goes, Stewie, he goes, I can tell you one thing. A racehorse is worth a hell of a lot more than you and me. They're going to take more of a risk with us than they are with those horses. And, yep. um, you know, so, yeah, he, he would use this injectable <laughs> B12, and it was bright red. You know, it looked like yep. cordial, cordial and, and, you know, he, he loved the stuff. He swore by it. But, um, yeah, it's just um, – it's so funny that you say that because a lot of the – you even look at, like, some of the fat-stripping compounds, clenbuterol, you know, mm -hmm. these, these are animal compounds for animal medicine, right? Yeah, yeah. and then we – and we and someone says, oh, hang on, look at that research. If you can try it on that animal, then surely it's going to work on a human. And, and obviously, you know, they do transition across. But um, – but like, you know, with same thing again, you know, with carnitine, there's so many different forms of it and obviously different ones are more soluble. And that's with anything like, you know, create the argument of creatine mono, all the research really is done on creatine mono, but there's, you know, hydrochloride, there's AKG, there's, there's so many different forms of it. And the idea of all those different forms is really just to try to in, improve the uptake of them. So, you know, if it's more, if it has a, a malate, it's obviously more soluble, AKG very very easy to transition into your into your body rather than just passing through you so that's generally where a lot of those different forms of things are beneficial is that they're just way more soluble whether it's a you know vitamin mineral so not a vitamin mineral same kind of deal you know you get a very insoluble form like a you know magnesium oxide or calcium oxide carbonate generally you know you think of those as chalk and they're just going to mm. kind of you know be very very hard to solubilize and get into the body whereas as soon as you bond it with a you know some type of acid um and that's where you get the other forms of it so that that's kind of where i think we're drilling down in supplements now and we're getting more mindful about what type of of each mineral are we putting in what type of each um creatine but then on the flip side of that is really no research around it but essentially once it gets into your body it turns into the same thing and then it, it's, it, it's you know you're back to where you were does it frustrate you christine i know this frustrates the hell out of me <clears throat> when i'm using something i know it works right i know that it works like because my like when i was bodybuilding anyway my diet, my lifestyle was very controlled. So anything different that I put in, I could definitively tell you the impact that it's having, but yeah. then the data didn't back up 
what I experienced on it. So, so you were just mentioning um, El Kana team before, yeah, and you know, saying how like for you it is a absolute weapon for fat loss, and I, yeah. I would agree with that on, on personal experience. But then the data doesn't quite. Agreed. I guess back up the way that we're feeling it. And tribulus is is another yeah. one for me that's like that, where it's like tribulus for me was always an amazing product. If I wanted to blow up, I could use tribulus and just see amazing results. But then the, the science didn't back what I was saying, and I was just like, I'd get so the, frustrated. The, it, it's it's not. It's more what it doesn't frustrate me as much as it more frustrates when people will take a snatch and grab out of a research paper. And, and kind of go, okay, well, there it is. And it's slightly related to this, but slightly not. It's that whole thing of, you know, why people think you can only have like 30 grams of protein in a, in a serving. And for some reason, they think that the rest of it just disappears or gets you know, <laughs> excreted or something. And that's because when you look at a research paper, you've got to look obviously at the conditions that it was done under, who it was done with, what time frame. And I think the thing that there's more coming out now, but there's very, very little research around heavy training bodybuilders like if you look at when they say resistance training and then you look at the protocol that they use and it was like oh they did four sets of leg extensions <laughs> and then we judged how much protein somebody needed you know so you're kind of going well, well that was my warm-up um, <laughs> and then they and then they do a study and they go oh actually when you trained more guess what you needed more protein Mm. Holy hell! Oh, so it's, it's, so it, stuff which is obvious to us, the but the thing is, with yeah. yeah so, so, so I think you've got to look at you got to look at who it's, who it was done on, like what population did they have some kind of impairment? Because a lot of um, glycemic index research, like when they test the glycemic index of food, a lot of it's done on people with diabetes. So it's yeah, done on right. people with impaired metabolism because that's who you're trying to fix. So. Mm done on a person who doesn't have an issue, done on a person who does have an issue, you're going to get two totally different results. And then even within that, you're going to get totally different results. So I think that, you know, we ourselves, as you said, we are so in tune with what we do. And particularly when we're in a comp prep mode, like we know like something's, you know, someone put salt in my food by accident. We can tell, you know, like mm. we, we know exactly what's reacting because because our diet is so pure and we are just so focused on how flat we feel, how pumped we feel, how much energy we have. So we know, and, and but that's what I'm saying, like nobody's really researching um, bodyboarders who are training to that nth degree on a low calorie diet because there's so many other variables. Like, you know, was, was the person on a controlled diet when they were taking the, the, the carnitine? What were they eating it with? Um, you know, that's, you know, maybe by default, the way that we, we're having our diet, it's, it's, it's working, or maybe it's just that we're taking such dope, because I know I never take 100 milligrams, or I've always taken pretty hefty serving of carnitine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. me too. I've gone, I've gone overboard to a point where I start to smell like a, like a fishmonger from time to time. <laughs> I that was a really, that's, that's a really fascinating one, actually, the, um, the, the fishy odour with carnitine. I didn't realise what that was about, and that was... Um, Monoamine oxidase was the um, so MAO. Um, I guess is, is one way your body can um, metabolize uh, in the liver choline. I believe it was. Uh, it can be either pushed down one pathway or another, and it'll go to um, TMAO goes in MAO through the liver, and that essentially through uh, metabolism that, that metabolite of choline gives the fishy odor. Uh, and card and cardotine happened to enhance the metabolism of choline. I, thought, I think it was in the paper I read, uh, and that's what that's where the the origins of that whole fish. And same with I suppose keto diets and so on. But um, yeah, particularly the cardotine thing. I, I was really curious one day. I was like, why why does this stuff make me smell like a fish market? Uh, and I, <laughs> so I went reading. Those eight means. Yeah, yeah those eight Because that's the thing. So because when we look at those kind of compounds from a food technologist point of view. We don't look at it necessarily from a the me metabolic, like we kind of, we obviously learn all of that, but all those, the different cycles and that for food technologists is kind of like, oh man, I'm never going to remember this. But we look at it from a flavoring perspective, because if you look at, if you, because you know how you'll see the word flavor on a, on a product, if you actually saw a recipe for a flavor, so I used to work for a flavor company and lot like it's the chemicals give certain flavors and odors and obviously that's what builds together to create a flavor and obviously amines are fishy smelling stuff mm. you know it's like um well, <laughs> yeah like terpenes are obviously lemony so yeah so that's like part of food technology is you're looking at um you know those components as a contributor to to creating a flavor and and the, so, the, so, you know, the interesting thing though about that fish smell 
um, with carnitine is I found that with different people, different amounts of L-carnitine lead or of acetyl L-carnitine lead to the fishy smell. So like for me, if I get above about, above about nine grams a day, my, if I am sweating, then I start to notice a slight odor. But I've had friends who, you know, they can be taking, you know, three grams a day and, and absolutely reek. You can't even walk within two feet of them. So yeah. it's, it's interesting how everyone metabolizes it differently and, and, and gives off different. And, and, that, and that's what I mean. Like that's the thing with any research and that, whether it be how we digest food, how, like every single thing, we all have different tolerance levels. Your body mass obviously comes into play, how much water you're drinking, what the rest of your protein level in your diet is, your different sensitivities. It's like some people have BO and some people don't. Like it's, it's how our body bacteria is, like everything's different. And that's the other thing to remember with research too is that, again, you'll get a, like you'll come up with an average and they look at obviously the average of that set of data and the average of that set of data and they'll look at the, you know, the, the range and they'll say, is it statistically significantly different or not? But just bearing in mind that within that, you can have people from either extreme to either extreme. And, and again, this is just coming back to glycemic index. Um, we've put a lot of food through that kind of, kind of testing process and you get a number back and might say your food is you know, 70, but the lowest GI that someone recorded was 30 and the highest someone recorded was 99. Yeah. So it just basically means that it's so individual. Like our bodies, whilst we all have the same processes, how we actually react to those processes uh, it's just so different in every single person. Some of it's cultural, some of it's our physical activity, some of it's, you know, our history of what we've eaten. It's just everything comes into play with that. So um, oh, I love that's I love the thing it. with research. You, you've, got to, you've got to be really, really careful. Otherwise, you kind of like get locked into one thing. And that was, you know, that's a great thing with bodybuilding. Like we look at something and we look at one little part and we're like, okay, that's really great for that. And that's, you know, not really supplement related, but I'll, I'll bring it up, the DMP. How that was really great for fat loss, but oh, by the way, it's actually in rat poison and it will cook your cook your body. But bodybuilders kind of hooked onto that one little piece. Oh, it's going to strip fat. I'm I'm good. And and people used it, and, that, and that's I mean, it's like you've got to always look at everything. You can't just kind of look at something in isolation, or you're going to you know end up misinterpreting something, or um, you know going down the wrong path and just missing the bit, the big warning over here that says don't do it. So, so yeah, it's. Let's let's get some because I found one of the best responses we had from, from some of our podcast episodes were ones where we, um, I guess, re- sort of went through um, specifics more so. And what I thought I'd ask is on uh, supplements that you'd recommend almost anyone would benefit from. Like we said, we have very inconsistent data with non-trained individuals and so on. But things that if someone that if someone that walks in goes, you know, hi, you know, I'm new new to supplements, but I want to in general, you know, in generally just perform better. I might want to be a little bit fitter, a little bit stronger, um, recover a little bit faster. What in your time in the game have been the real needle movers in performance? What are the supplements that you think are really worthwhile for the average you know, person new to SUPS or even currently using SUPS that they should re- reintroduce as their, as their staples that actually work anecdotally back by, you know, what, what would you recommend? Cool. Okay. And it, unfortunately, it's nothing exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Never. And, 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 and carnitine <laughs> obviously is my number one. Like that, like to, to um, if you're prepping for a competition, if you're going to get a fat burner, make sure it's got a good dose of carnitine in it. Because literally, like everything else in um, in fat burners, there's so many different herbs, there's so many different ingredients, and there's there's lukewarm studies, as you say, about most of those things. At the very best, they might do those things, and at the very worst, they're probably just going to be healthy for you. Because, as I said, there's a lot of other benefits. Like nothing's singular and isolated. But if you're going to go for a fat burner, make sure it has a good dose of carnitine, some some form. Um, and again, obviously different ones, you know, some are better for liver cleansing, some are better for your, your mental focus as well, like your acetyl, um, some are predominantly found in your skeletal muscle, some in your heart. So if you have a heart issue or, you know, you want to improve cardio fitness, like I never get it, I can never remember to see the tart, tartrate or fumarate, one of those lives more in the heart muscle, obviously it irritates more for your liver and your acetyl for your brain. Um, but that would be my number one, if you're trying to prep for a show and you want a natural form of energy, like, cause the problem with pre-workouts that are highly caffeinated obviously is that you have them at night and then you wreck your sleep and sleep's probably my number one supplement <laughs> you know yeah. I'm, yeah so I actually use that as a as a as a pre-workout as I said I've used it for since day dot for like 30 years I've used carnitine as, as a pre-workout as well as a fat burner yeah. so without a doubt that would be my number one go-to someone wanted higher performance now 
with the like muscle strength and all that kind of stuff, if you, you know, if you can get your beta alanine and your, um, your creatine going and I love citrulline as well. Unfortunately, we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Um, but, th- but those three are probably like your most researched, proven um, and, and most beneficial for improving performance in the gym. Like, again, you're not going to get the, the steam out of it. You're not going to get the buzz out of it, but you're going to get actual strength out of it. You're going to get actual muscular endurance out of it. So those are kind of core things to use. As I said, they're normally in most of, other, most of your supplements, so you're not necess- you know you're not having to buy them singularly, even though you know you can, um, and people can be their own little chemists and everything. But I guess that that are the kind of key things that I'd be looking for in some type of form- performance supplement. Now, caffeine, um, a lot of great stuff around caffeine. I'm not going to knock caffeine, um, but it's it's that time of day that you take it and how you sent. You know, some people have different sensitivities. Some people don't like how it makes them feel anxious. But a good a good a serving of caffeine before you train is probably like before because I was in the era pre workout era pre pre workout era. Um, my um, you know my heavy weight sessions were pretty much filled just by you know a strong cup of coffee um, because I because you obviously you do notice the difference like it, it mentally gets you through that workout when you're feeling tired. So you know I'm not going to knock it. There's obviously controversial controversial research about whether or not creatine's deactivated by the caffeine. Um, at the moment, I'm ta- I'm not having coffee near when I have my creatine, and I'm definitely getting like strength benefit out of like I obviously use creolcalin because that's you know that's international protein product, and I think it's a better form of it. But I definitely notice that strength increase. I I get within a week, I get about two, three, four extra reps on a particular weight and I'm starting to move my weights up on that. So as I said, it's not exciting supplements. It's actually like the really, really boring ones, um, but they are the ones that I know work in my body. Everything else is like you can kind of switch it in and switch it out. Um, sorry, glutamine, of course, like, hey, again, that's been that's been my number. It's actually moving down the list um, because I'm kind of finding that there's, you know, there's... Um, other things I need better, but for gut health, um, you know, that's yes. what it does. It's not so great for, for like the research around it being good for recovery yeah. um, and actually yeah. being. That, that's a being, huge thing. Uh, the gut health side of glutamine. Like I really, Oh, that's why I was curious. I was going to see which, which way you use it, using it, you know, like upon rise fasted or before bed on that empty stomach to help with that, you know, gut permeability, gut wall lining. That, yeah. That's where I found the most therapeutic. Like that's where I like from what, so for uh, same sort of thing, I, you know, I just do a straight, um, glutamine and and ninety percent of the people I end up recommending it to is for the gut side of things, you know, really soothing that gut inflammation or helping with gut lining. Um, but it, also immunity, right. also immunity, because I I literally um, I get sick when I forget to breathe. Like if I run out of glutamine at home and I'm for some reason it takes me three days to remember to just go grab a tub out of the factory, um, right. I will get sick. Like it's probably hap- Like I've probably been sick say seven times in the last 10 years since we launched it. And five of those seven times literally have been when I've not taken my glutamine. So it's almost like now if I don't have it, I, I need it. So I'm like, I'm a dependent on my glutamine. See, but yeah. so, it's so interesting, Christine, that your favorite supplements, are uh, like the people who I speak to, who have been around this a long time or have competed at a very high level or, you know, whatever it is, all seem to say the same few. Have you, do you, you do you find that as well, Will? With everyone we've yeah. spoken to, creatine is always in there. Yeah. Um, and, and creatine is something that I've always said, like, if you're going to use a supplement for performance, let it be creatine. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's that cheap. Even if, you, even if you want to totally ignore the data, even if you want to totally ignore the studies and, and you know, think it's too hard, um, you may as well take it just for good measure because it's that cheap. It's costing you nothing to take it. It's yeah. safe. It's like, it's safe and effective. Like, um, you know, glutamine, like you just said, I've used creatine and glutamine probably for the last 10 years, um, you know, and absolutely love them. And it's like when people say to me, Stu, what are your favorite supplements? And I say creatine and glutamine. You see this disappointment in their eyes. I think it goes, <laughs> this is really, really interesting when I speak, because this is a trend as well when I'm listening to experts in their fields and, and you'll find like, you expect some massive revealing, um, you know, biohack or some sort of crazy life-changing thing. Like I listened to a mind-blowing podcast yesterday with Eric Helms um, getting interviewed around, I guess, you know, um, aging and, and things that are, um, and I guess sleep and pro, like 
he went through all sorts of data on you know protein intake it's linked to sleep quality or it went through this monster it was like an hour and a half episode on sprawling about general health and well-being and it ends up boiling down i'm like right here comes the punchline this is gonna be really cool what's he recommend for like what does a guy who's one of the most educated guys in the space recommend for longevity for health for drive performance and i'm like all right cool get the notepad out and it's like i'll oh, sleep two more hours a day beats all beats everything beats everything and he goes you know a few other things that are handy he goes it might be useful to do things like limit alcohol might be useful to do things like exercise regularly data is inconclusive on these on xyz the one thing that data suggests is this you know and, and you know is sleeping longer and sleeping deeper is probably the bit the most you know all cause mortality decreases everything and it's something so simple just says sleep more and this is a guy who is beyond, leagues beyond most people's education level in the industry that are currently promoting whatever it might be and i know it's you, you get disappointed, but same point. You're like, well, you can't. Like, that's what's actually studied, actually works. Like, you can't fault it. Like, you know, creatine, carnitine. I can't. I mean, it's boring, but it, it works. <laughs> so, like, yeah. and, and that, and that, and, and that's the other thing too. Because, and there's so many fads that I have seen come and go throughout this industry. And I remember, like, one of my favorite ones was when I was at uni. Does anyone remember when um, Lou Ferrigno was promoting? It was like carbo fire or something, and it had this gamma frack or something. Yeah, it was like this was, ingredient. That was just was, before it, my it was, time, Christine. That's before my time. <laughs> or there was, there was, it was basically it was an alpha. Sorry, it wasn't the gamma frack. That was somebody else. But it was it had alpha ketoglutarate in it, Ooh. and we were like, oh my god, it's this high energy. It's like all these. And I took it to my um, my nutrition lecture at uni, and I'm like, what do you know about this this stuff? And he looks at it and he goes, oh. 1.17 gram in there. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> now that's about two calories worth. <laughs> he goes, he goes, yep, it's going to give you that energy real fast. But he goes, are you going to notice two calories? Yeah, yeah. Isn't and, it and, crazy and, and, like that, how these different, like there's always the, like somebody's come up with the new big thing. Like I remember um, when, um, when molecular nutrition first um, released uh, their arison, arach arachidonic acid. And I thought, this is going to be like, this is it. They've, they've cracked the code. Arachidonic acid. <laughs> they've cracked the code, you know. Yep. And so I went just, I'm loading up on arachidonic acid and, and still not noticing as good effects as I notice on just good old-fashioned creatine monohydrate. Right. Yeah. That, was a, that was a classic period, hey, where they said, you know, like, oh, inflammation caught, you know, has some links to muscle growth. Let's put a very pro-inflammatory pro omega-6 into us for, at massive doses. Um, that, that was a really, like, good example of bodybuilders going, oh, this will cause systemic inflammation massively and fuck me entirely. But, hey, I might get an extra 3% muscle growth this, this month. Let's do it. And, I, like, and we all, like, it was, it was such a, like, great example. Like, body, that's why I love bodybuilding because it is such an extreme sport. And those, that little 1% is worth ignoring the rest of it for. So, you know, like, you know, like who would want to take an, an amino acid, like an omega fat that purely in, promotes inflammation? Like, know it in Gen Pop and be like, what? Like, why, why do you want to be inflamed? And, you know, it was, oh, it's, a, it's amazing. Yeah. But the carnitine phase, what dose though, out of curiosity? Because everyone has different dosing protocols of that too. And um, so two part, one is dose on, on carnitine, how you like to do it throughout the day. And two is, I guess with the latest changes with consumers seeing a lot of shifting in their favorite fat burning supplements and so on, is there any changes that you, um, that are, that what you mentioned with carnitine and allowances in caffeinated beverages and that sort of thing? Um, oh, okay. So carnitine is not allowed in a caffeinated beverage, unfortunately, but it is allowed in a sports supplement. And that's about the only thing that's changed in the last decade is that they raised the level of carnitine from hundred milligrams to 2000 milligrams. I think it was just last year that that got changed. So that was a massively positive step. And I think that that's a really great place to start in terms of dosages. Um, I've never done anything under one gram. Um, admittedly, um, I don't even know how much my teaspoon weighs, but I'm, just, I'm very liberal <laughs> with my carnitine. <laughs> and I'll do it twice a day. Like I'll do it before fasted cardio and I'll do it again uh, before my weights work out as part of my, my mixture uh, in there. So that's, that's the dosage thing. Like, I, you know, I think the limiting thing is obviously odour. Um, because again, you know, if you don't really need it, your body's just gonna, you know, break it down and it's gonna get excreted. It's got to get get go through some pathway to get rid of it. So you don't need that amount. But I think most of the, the clinical um, studies to to look at performance and that type of thing, you are looking at that one to two grams at least. Um, yeah. And as I said, up to five grams, I think is perfectly fine. So that that's kind of where I sit. Like you know, in that 
you're not going to do under two grams and I probably don't go over about five. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. I do nine. Oh. You're, you're bigger than me. You're bigger than me. <laughs> hey, hang on, hang on. If know. anyone hasn't seen Christine's legs, I think Christine's calves are bigger than me. Like, I mean, her one calf is bigger than my entire body, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Christine, <laughs> I was going to ask you, Christine, um, just to sort of um, clarify for those people who don't understand the difference between a caffeinated beverage, a supplementary sports food, um, you know, does something that contains caffeine, if, if a product contains caffeine, does that mean it must be classified as a caffeinated beverage? And does that no. mean that um, caffeine and carnitine can't exist together in the same product? No, nope. nope. doesn't mean that at all. What it means is you can't, you, so just so in case people don't know, there's obviously, again, various ways that you can get caffeine. So caffeine and hydrous basically is the chemical version of caffeine. So it's like a pure crystalline thing. That is what you cannot put into a formulated supplementary sports food. Okay, so that's a big no-no. Got to go into caffeinated beverage and there's limits around the concentration. So it can't be too dilute and it can't be too concentrated. And that's why you'll see all those, um, oh, make this up with 1.1 litre of water and stuff like that. Because you basically, you've got, if you're having 350 milligrams of caffeine, it has to be at a certain dilution uh, to fit within the regulations. Now, if you're going to use caffeine from green coffee, from guarana, green tea, any of those natural sources that naturally contain caffeine, you're allowed to put those into sports food because they are from a herbal base. Now, there, it is a little bit more complex than that because the technical definition is that it's supposed, like you're supposed to put green tea just as it would come from, you know, the green, green tea, tea bag kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't Which, have green tea standardised to 99% caffeine. <laughs> correct, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. No, so so that's where so there can be some caffeine. So you can build it up from what's naturally in there, but it's it's um again, it's kind of one of those grey, grey areas around how much exactly is in there because there's there is like there's so many different levels that are available. Um and you know, obviously sports food, there is a little bit of standardization going on, but you know, the, the technical definition of food is it's meant to be this. They do tend to be ignoring that unless it's again starts to cause a problem. So they can exist together, but it's got to have to come from a natural source. So that's why you won't see caffeine and hydrous in a formulated supplementary sports food. That's an absolute no-no, um, but a product can still have caffeine. And, and Coffee Robusta um, is actually, like obviously coffee powder that you purchase from, you know, just in, your, in the coffee section, um, mm. that's allowed to go into sports food. Now, obviously, um, there's a lot of collagen coffees and, and things like that. We have our own RTG coffee flavor one which has 125 milligrams of caffeine and that's not that it's in this it's actually in a um not formulated supplementary sports food it's just a formulated supplementary food which is another category which has other requirements and it's more what you think about meal replacements and um basically fortified foods um we yeah, 125 milligrams all coming from basically coffee powder so if we were to put carnitine in that those two can also actually sorry carnitine can't go into that standard but if i flipped it into sports food standard i'm still allowed to put the coffee powder in i'm still allowed to put carnitine in so there's ways around it and you know the, the fact that just yeah basically like a, a jar of coffee doesn't have like you're buying coffee you're getting caffeine um so yeah it's not that it can't be put in it's just that it's you not you don't know if it's stand like what is the amount is it always the same yeah, yeah. Um, but it, but with most of those coffee powders, they are actually, if you look at a specification, they'll say, okay, this is the minimum amount of caffeine that will be in this. Um, obviously, cocoa has a small amount of caffeine as well. So there's natural, plenty of natural things around there. It's just that a lot of them do tend to have a, a strong flavour, like coffee really limits what you can put with it. Um, mm. You know, guarana is like not the greatest tasting thing yeah. very brown earthy kind of a um, material once you put it into a product so normally the limitation then just does become the actual flavor of the product it's like everyone wants to use beet for the nitrates and then it's like you do realize that you're limited to anything which is now a red flavor um because the the cut the dosage that you need to use and it's just going to turn your product so red that there's nothing else you can do with it and you're just not going to taste anything else so yeah those kind of things are, you know, it's great in theory, but then putting it into your product and making it so you can have four different flavours and, and person actually wants to drink this, you know, every day is, is another story. So that's where some products are good, but they just never really get off the ground because um, because of that. And then and there's a, um, it's, it's not 
now with the changes, it's not so permitted, but there was a one of the compound solutions ingredients, which was um, touted to give really good sports performance, but it was tasted like miso soup. Pico soup. So it just yeah. didn't, yeah, just yeah. never... Never got anywhere. Like no, nobody wanted like miso flavored. Can't mask it very well. <laughs> it was a, no, it was no, nothing. Christine, in your, do you feel like we need another um, governing body, like what New Zealand's done? Do you think that that's the best option for Australia? Do you feel like we need a third governing body to oversee? Um, our our supplementary space, or like, what do you think the best solution? Because obviously, at the moment. And this is, you know, maybe your opinion is different to this, but I think it's a shambles and there's, and that there's some real issues with it, at, with, with the way that the system works at the moment. Well, how do you think we solve that? What do you think the best option is? I think what they're doing at the moment, which is really expanding that section, which is the formulated supplementary sports food, I think for Australia, for the size of population that we are, creating another body because we, because remember too that within TGA we kind of have pharmaceutical and we already have complementary health, mm. and really we're bridging complementary health. So to create another body essentially means we have four bodies, and then I think there just be even more confusion because, but in the background, of course, who funds this? Who looks mm. out for our best interest? And that's a you know that's another contentious thing is to the food body, FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, as your Kellogg's, your Coca Cola, and all those guys. They got a lot of money, and they are, you know, they're kind of lobbying and doing their stuff over here. And then you've got complementary health, which has got much bigger margins and sports food, and they've got all this stuff going on over here. I think if we created another body, we literally would kind of get. Um, I think it would get a little bit lost because there isn't the funds to do what we need to do behind it. So we kind of need to come under a little bit of the protection of complementary health, but we need to really work on keeping it in food. Mm. Um, because we don't, because I think anytime you bring in that extra step of it and, and because of all that, the, you know, the, the regulation and the, that there's a lot of cost gets added. So we want safety for, for people. We want things to be safe, but at the same time, because to me, it's still food. You don't want to complicate things by adding extra levels of red tape and, and which just goes cost, 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 cost. So, you know, your pre-workout's now $110 on the shelf instead of 60 or 70. So, that's the thing to keep in mind in the background. I think the, the move to just expand what's existing already, like there's already a great framework in terms of what we can do, but it's just outdated. And then, so they need do to update it. Do you think it. that someone needs to be brought into, say, for example, the TGA who has an understanding of I, our space? Like, it seems like there's nobody there. Like, from I think they brought someone in. I think there is okay. actually a guy that's just been brought in recently. Um, he's very supplement focused. Um, like, we had, we had a meeting the other week where basically all the people in the industry kind of got together and said, hey, how do we want to approach this? And complementary health has, you know, somewhat been putting sports under their wing. But, if, I mean, this is probably a little bit not interesting to people, but literally what the kind of money that they want to charge is based around complementary health margins. So when they look at how much we need to pay based on our turnovers and you look at supplement margins, nobody wants to join because it's just ridiculous. So they're looking yeah. at how they can make it so that we can all join. And they have brought someone on board who's very supplement background orientated to, to talk our language and to, commu so, you know, to communicate back with food standards. So I think it's happening and moving in the right direction where we've got that thing. A lot of it is going to depend too on, on us as industry people to get on the same page and have the same message because I know in the past it's kind of failed because someone still wanted to put capsules in and, and um, you know, the people who don't do capsules, which are never never have been allowed in food, but now they've suddenly given people like an extra couple of years to kind of get them out of their food and get them into TGA. But there's always been arguments within the people who are importing the products, which we can't make, and us kind of going, well, what are we meant to do? And they're saying, but we don't want to change this. So it's it's always also been a, a bit of a, a fight within the industry. So we need to get on the same page about what we want and be really, really clear and then fight as a united front to get that. And I think once we get it, it's then going to be the mechanism to how we change it. It can't be a highly expensive, um, exclusive kind of process. It's got to be something where if, um, you know, there's solid data on it and, it, and it's agreeing on what that looks like, um, and then obviously knowing that then pushing the companies that are making these products to really have that safety data to start with because that's, as I said, that's the first place that they're going to look is the safety. They don't really care 
if it's going to do us any better because because as you know sport for the government is somewhat optional um but safety is is not so if we can say look this stuff is safe it's up to us to to kind of go well we think it works or it doesn't work i mean obviously there's research and data but it's you know as we're kind of our we're our own experimenters in some way so if it's you know half as good as what it's meant to be and we think we're getting a benefit out of it then let us continue to take it it's like you say some people will get you know this reaction at this level and other people you you know you take something you feel nothing you don't take that supplement anymore Mm. you know people people don't keep on taking stuff that they don't feel something out of so it's 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 one of those things where yeah, it's exactly. Like, it's the same with caffeine. You know, two, like the the studies again on, on it being for ergonomic aid is two to four milligrams per kilo. But you know, so hundred kilo dude, four hundred milligrams pre workout though, and a lot of like not a lot of gen pop that would just ruin their lives. Like you know, like if you you're, if the most you know caffeinated thing you have a day is a coffee or at most a Red Bull, eighty to hundred milligrams caffeine. Throw four hundred in, they're not going to use it. So it's a pretty much it's like Darwinistic, isn't it? Like it's self regulating to an extent. Like if these people. are Running, you know, like I guess, hey, look, this this feels terrible. I won't use this again. I'll use two hundred milligrams. See how that goes, you know. And there's there's not much um, in that space currently. I, I I like that our our industry is so tightly regulated. It does scare me a bit when you look at like the US model and how and how how many cowboys are in that space. And and it like it's fun to dream as a formulator how much how much more freedom we would have. You know, you, you know, like still using your mines and everything in pre's and everything. You're like, oh, that'd be fun in theory. But we're lucky here in that we have got such rigid control but like you said it was supplements are such a unique space and they've they've really blown up in the last few years in particular and now there's this massive booming aussie based market trying to formulate cutting edge stuff and we're trying to bring to the market really unique products um and i think it's really hard for people uh to sort of you know um for to keep up like the industry to keep up and regulations to keep up i suppose um mm-hmm. rate that ingredients are getting looked at particularly herbally um you know, like things like in, in like you mentioned Pico too before, and, and you know ratios and cordyceps, they they only just got recognised in the British Pharmacopoeia only. Um, I think it was in like two thousand, and they've been used for like several thousands of years in China. You know, with the royalty and and it was it was actually they actually kept it out of their Pharmacopoeia because it was responsible. It was literally limited to royalty to use. <laughs> you know, like these these incredible you know elixirs. You know, um, got to be good then. It's got to be good. Got to be good. Kept it to themselves. Yeah, the Chinese royalty wouldn't let the the um regular people have it because it was reserved for the 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 um the elite so like you know it's been used for thousands of years for millions of different purposes but you know like until you put it in a paper it doesn't it doesn't count so but uh, yeah that's a really interesting one when you said the example with the carnitine and like you know calling a caffeinated beverage even though it's caffeinated but sources matter and so on so i think there will be you know a lot of a lot of change we as a podcast actually started funny enough um around the first announcement, that December sort of announcement of, of TJ saying there's some stuff coming. Um, this would be huge. And we actually started the, the, this the What's Up podcast um, with Matt Highgate as well, sitting down going, look, we need to you know put together a voice for the supplement industry and, and get some education out there, get people aware. So, I, I, I to, you know, today being able to, you know, lean in, you know, sort of, you know, pick your brain on, on I guess, you know, some of that framework in Australia and what it means for what consumers will see on the shelf coming soon. Um, you know, some things they might look out for, like, a lot of customers now won't be aware, but seeing things like citrulline malate and, and their 3.2 beta they love, despite the data as being different, uh, you know, all those sort of things, you know, sort of um, going, you know, I think it's, I think it's going to be a big, a big process in educating everyone um, as to, you know, <laughs> And I think half the people formulating don't know themselves at the moment what's allowed. Uh, well, honestly, I saw a guy, I had a, um, you know, as you know, um, Christine, when um, in the industry, when you have um, store a store or multiple stores, you get approached almost weekly by new companies wanting you to stock their product. I had someone um, who has done this beautiful looking product. Like, you know, there's put all this effort into the labeling and the jar and it all looks fantastic and that. And one glance at the ingredients, they're about to launch this to market. And one look at the ingredients, I went, this is not compliant. They're like this, like it just doesn't fit within what, what the new regs have just been announced. I can't take it on. I'm sorry. Like it looks fantastic. It's beautiful. You put all this time, energy and money into it, but you know, you've got, like novel compounds in there you've got you know you've used beta alanine you've used this you've used that like i, I just i can't even consider it um and i just feel so bad for people at the moment that they they aren't really up to scratch on what's going on 
Well, well, that was actually comes back to your original question too around like, you know, getting into it and people kind of just going, oh, supplements, let's make, make some money off of this. With the world being how it is, when you've got access to see what's happening in America, people not understanding that the laws, it's not like there's a world law, like, you know, there's a law from country to country and in Australia how each state even handles, handles it. And I think that that's one of the really important things is that obviously if you're going into a market, you kind of need to know some type of the regulation around the market that you're going into. And if there's a reason why other people aren't doing it, it's probably because it's not allowed. And that's probably the number one thing we find with people that come to us with formulations is they're like, oh, it's so great because we're the only ones doing it. And it's kind of like, do you, it's not because you're the first person that thought of it. <laughs> um, it's just because, because, you know, we're all reading, seeing what's coming out of the States or reading the same research papers, but there's a reason why we're not doing it. And that whole piece of, um, you know, which way is it going to go compliance trying to be more compliant trying to trying to um you know like i still i think there's still a lot of gray supplements but the way i see it very very black and white is anything that was on the poisons list is definitely off limits um absolute no no cannot have that in a product uh, and and rightly so because they were basically chemicals um like to be honest with lotus leaf that ended up on the king's i didn't even like i remember the first time it came through a formulation i'm like there is no way that stuff is allowed and then it's like, oh, no, it can be important. I'm like, oh, okay, because that was one of the, I guess, any, a supplement that I got taught was basically poisonous. So the fact that it's on the poisons list now, I'm kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense now. And, yeah, lotus, lotus leaf is not, it, it, like, it, it is toxic, um, yes. hence why it's on that list because of safety reasons and, and things like that. So this, oh, those, that's a great segue. And I, and I think one thing that everyone wants to know at the moment, there's a lot of talk around, Obviously, DMHA was banned forever ago, but then we've seen, um, you know, we've seen juglins, we've seen English walnut, we've seen all these different compounds, and they, you know, in their in their naturally occurring forms, it's it's okay and stuff. But I, I do I do often like there's a lot of rumours around it. You know, oh, is it going to go in completely? They're going to crack down on, you know, because a lot of consumers now are seeing their pre workouts, they're still they're still enjoying very high stimulant based pre workouts with things like English walnut and stuff in there. Um, and before that, I think it was juglins that they used, and and you know, before that there was great dmha before the ban and so on so i guess in those sort of areas where you're saying yeah like lotus leaf and a lot of you like you know noble orchid and those sort of things that have come and gone do you see that being the case as well with um english walnut coming and going well, well english walnut's actually an interesting one that you've brought up there because english walnut itself like we have our material tested to make sure that there is no dma or any of cousins of that particular compound but english walnut itself and, the, and this is just the pure form is actually related to cognitive function like there's it's one of the um you know one of the i guess the top 10 um herbals or, or natural substances which actually has promise in cognitive function i guess particularly in alzheimer's disease but obviously we're going to translate that through into sports performance so the the rumor has it i guess that the dma and and people were just kind of putting that in there on the label, but actually putting the chemical in the product. Yep. And that's where I think some confusion kind of popped up because the because English walnut, whilst has that cognitive function, it's not because of that particular compound. It's, you know, it's a very complex thing. I don't think they've really isolated what it is that's doing it. I just know the research is that black English walnut, which is your normal walnut, and that's just people eating the nut, um, have a, a cognitive lift. So the English walnut itself other than being an allergen factor, which we now have to label for, um, as far as I'm concerned, is it, it should it, you know, that should be okay again. Pure extracts um, of whatever, but I, it's not even it's not even that particular compound. It's not DMA or anything related that's in that product. So we're using it. Um, you know, we, we as I said, we've had we have ours tested to make sure it doesn't contain any of that. But the research around English walnut, walnut itself is actually pretty positive, and I think that that's something. Um, you know, just if people are in, eating more walnuts as a part of their, you know, mental health and that type of thing. So it's not as potent, obviously, as those other ingredients, but that's a good thing, but it still does have an effect on, um, you know, that, that ability to think quicker, chain, you know, let your thoughts change direction and, and just basically have a better better cognitive process. So, hmm. yeah, I, th I think that's one of the well, ones. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a really important point you made there too, Christine, is that like a lot of the... Um, a lot of those botanical compounds, like even if you look at things like, um, like um, oh, what was it, the, the dendrobium that they were using and stuff like that, no one ever actually used dendrobium. They just kept the formula the same and just 
changed the name to dendrobium in the hopes that that would somehow <laughs> that would somehow fly, which it obviously never would. Or the other thing you had was that um, people would order dendrobium, but they but you know they would have the manufacturers from China or whatever India, wherever it may be, adding com- components to that, like DMAA or DMHA, um, and then claiming that it's dendrobium. Um, and that's where it gets really muddy. Like that's where it gets really, really muddy in terms of um, what's actually going on with the manufacturing space and, um, you know, the, those types of things which are possible. And, you know, we, we had one customer that came to us with a product that was being made overseas. They wanted us to make it in Australia and exactly that herbal, herbal, herbal all on the label. And we tried it and I, I had to give him a call. I said, oh, could you please tell me that there's, this is the chemicals in it. There's no herbal because there was not not one particular. There was it was like crystal clear beverage. Mm. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, a herb yeah, inside, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they were like, "Oh yeah, that might be the case." And I'm like, "Well, look for Australia, you can't do that. You're happy to go ahead." And they're like, "Yep, yeah, fine, just put the herbals, um, herbal version in." Because um, because again, coming back to food, you know, we're talking about extracts and whatnot. But in um, whenever I've spoken to Fazans, they've always said, like for example, you know, you can put the green tea or whatever, but you cannot put the synthetic version of it. So, again, brindleberry slash garcinia, which is, again, if you get unlucky with one particular council, they'll pull it out. Another council won't care. Hydroxycitric acid is obviously why you're using that particular component, but if you use the, you know, the pure form of hydroxycitric acid, that's a chemical. You can't put a chemical in food. Mm. You can't really put the brindleberry in either, but in that natural form, it's kind of more acceptable. Um, and that's always what it's been. If you have the herbal form versus the synthetic form, synthetic can't go in food. And that's where the caffeine comes back to, like herbal form, fine, synthetic, not okay. And that just travels all the way through. Theanine's another great example. Can't put theanine in, but there's green tea, which has theanine in it. Definitely. So Yeah, yeah. That was an yeah. interesting space, actually. I was, when I was speaking to TGA regulators before and they were saying that was the um, that was the example they used, actually, funnily enough. They were, they were saying, okay, so, for example, you know, you can use decaffeinated green tea uh, to get your L-theanine, but if you're using it, it naturally has 10% caffeine naturally occurring. So technically it's a caffeinated beverage. I'm like, oh, but it's green tea leaf. And that, that, you know, that, that there's, you know, that's something that's, that, that can surely be argued that it's, you know, supplementary sports food. Can I, you know, cause I was, cause carnitine was a big point of contention at that point as well with the caffeinated beverage, allow, you know, additions and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, that, that, that was the exact example I said. They said green tea obviously has between 25 to 60 milligrams of theanine naturally occurring per cup. Um, you know, per cup of green tea. Um, obviously, though, it's caffeinated, but also, you, you know, so you can use a non-caffeinated green tea, but the argument that I put forward was, well, you know, that's modifying the natural source. To, you know, wouldn't you, wouldn't you want an unmodified mm. you know, tea leaf, and, you know, as, as a food rather than a... Yeah, so it's, it's a really it's, funny space with so much interpretation, and I think a lot of consumers listening and a lot of supplement store owners listening to this episode will get a heap of value because I think getting a little bit of education around this, they're looking to people like ourselves as brands and we're looking to our factories as well to get a more robust understanding around, around this space. Cause it's such a, the, the framework's still a little bit behind the industry. So we're trying to you know, get an episode like this where we could sit down and really nut out um, some of the, the, you know, the real nitty gritties of it. And, and hopefully we can give some of our supplement store owners um, some more, you know, some more um, shed some light on it. Uh, you know, other formulators too, who listen, this can be a really, really valuable episode, I think. So I'm really glad we actually went, went down this tangent quite a bit too, because I think this is something that everyone's asking questions on in our industry. A lot of our listeners are people who run sub stores, run brands, have got you know, very involved in a PT, so, you know, like people do just stock supplements as well. Like it's a, you know, and a lot of them are asking this every day to me. They're going, oh, so what's, what's going on with this? What's happening with this? What's going with, and you, know, you sort of go, oh, it depends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I and wish there was a straight answer. Yeah, yeah just, which is like what you get when every time you ask an expert. I find if you ask someone who actually knows their shit, usually they they'll say it depends. Uh, it is the answer I get <laughs> out of hand um, when someone's switched on. But yeah, so no, th- no, thank you very much for that. Um, giving us some illumination in that space where we all need it in the game at the moment. No, no one's completely across this. So um, yeah, it was really valuable. And it's also going to be one of those things where time will tell. Um, and just to put things in perspective as well, um, again, the supplement industry as a whole is kind of not as high profile as what, say, the supermarket is. So I know someone who had a product in the supermarket that was had lion's mane in it, 
um, yeah. and they have got into all kinds of strife over that because it's, you know, novel food. Um, had that same product been in a health food store, is less, less likely to have the same kind of scrutiny because whilst it's a massive industry to us, in the scale of how many people you reach, like you think about every single Woolworths, Coles, you're in one of those kind of stores and, the, and the, you know, the millions of people that you're reaching through those versus still the supplement industry is a lot smaller in relation to that. And we do tend to kind of fly under the radar to that degree because we don't want to really hit, a, you know, the people who are going into those stores are a little bit more knowledgeable or you're getting specialist advice at the counter. You're not just kind of walking in and picking something off the shelf like what you do in a supermarket. So that is in our favour in some ways. Um, yeah. But it, and, that, and that's where we just kind of have to, I think, as an industry, you know, try to do the right thing because it's ultimately, you know, the safety of the people who do use the product, that's kind of, that does need to be the, the main concern. Because as I said, I think, you know, you will find if something works for you or doesn't work for you, but if it's something's going to harm you, then that's the stuff that we want to, you know, stay away from, understand what, where the regulators are coming from from that point of view, and then just, you know, wait and see as things catch up and, and do what we can to have a united voice around what we think we need to have in products and how much so that there's less, less confusion. Yeah. Right. hundred right percent. Yeah. I think that's a really good um, note to end on there. Um, Christine, I just really wanted to say thanks for, um, for taking some time out of your uh, schedule to come on today. It's My been a pleasure. pleasure talking to you. Um, you know, so yeah, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks for having me. And yeah. Yeah. Um, hopefully people do find this really useful. I'm sure they Beautiful. will. Fantastic, guys. Look, we'll cool. wrap that up for another episode of the What's Up podcast. Thanks for listening, guys. And um, I hope you guys got a ton of value out of today's episode. So we'll wrap it up this time and hope to see you guys on our next episode coming soon.